Hi, welcome back, everybody. We're going to get started now with the with the panel discussion. And I'm pleased to. I'm Judy Chess from Capital Projects, and I help administer the Chancellor's Advisory Committee on Sustainability and spend some of those dollars that Vice Chancellor Denton so generously provides. Uh, provides to the committee for its activities. We're very pleased this afternoon to be hosting a panel of alumni who are going to talk about uh, working in the sustainability field. And uh, we're going to be, the panel will be moderated by Professor Joan Walker, and I'm pleased to introduce Joan. Joan joined UC Berkeley in 2008 in civil and environmental engineering, and also as a member of the Interdisciplinary Global Metropolitan Studies Initiative. She received her bachelor's in civil engineering from UC Berkeley and her master's and PhD from civil and environmental engineering from a little school back east called MIT. She's a recipient of the Pref Pref Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, and I'm not even going to try to read the acronym, but it is the highest honor bestowed by the US government on scientists and engineers beginning their independent careers. Her research focuses on behavior modeling with an expertise in discrete choice analysis and travel behavior. She works to improve the models that are used for transportation planning, policy, and operations. And we've been lucky to have Joan talk to us, talk to the committee, and give a lecture as part of our CAC series. She's an active member of the Chancellor's Advisory Committee on Sustainability. And please join me in welcoming Professor Walker. Thank you. Thank you so much for that nice introduction, and it's really a pleasure to be here. I have to say, being involved in CACs and seeing the energy that, in particular, that the students bring, no, I mean, and of course, all the staff and not many faculty, but, um, but it's really been a pleasure in terms of it being at this university and just the energy that the students have and the change they want to make. And so uh, this panel, I think, will be really fun and exciting. I realize it's the ninth annual summit, and I think it's the first time we're really focusing on careers in sustainability, which really make a lot of sense at, at a university. So what we're going to do here is first I'll introduce each of the three panelists, and then we have some questions. That, oh, I also have to thank Kayla and Catherine, who really made my job very easy um, in terms of coming up with questions for the panelists and organizing the whole thing and, CACs, and thanking CACs in general. So, I'll introduce the panelists, then we'll go through some questions, um, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. And so one of the things I would say is I've told the panelists to feel free to play off each other and interrupt. This should be an informal, you know, small group. The whole goal is to figure out, try, try to learn from their experiences. They've successfully navigated, well, Cal mostly, except one who wants to come here, just a new sub. I'll get to that in a minute. But, um, but certainly successfully navigated Cal and also careers in sustainability. So to learn from them and their experiences and their mistakes and their thoughts on, in particular, where our graduates, um, how they can navigate their careers. OK, so first of all, and the panelists, we have uh, all sorts of diversity in terms of public and nonprofit, and private and domestic and international and entrepreneurial. And not many men up here, I notice. So. Um, <laughs> Mira and I were talking about it, so I'm an engineer, and I'm, I've, I don't think I've ever been on a panel with all women, so it's very lovely. And Mira has a, <laughs> and Mira has a similar. She's a, a worked worked with Dow. So okay, so first of all, let me introduce Laura Moreno on the your right. Uh, she is an environmental scientist at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. She focuses on sustainable materials management, which is focusing on reducing the environmental impacts of goods throughout their life cycle, so not just the disposal part. She spends most of her time focusing on food waste, um, which this is, was news to me, the number one material reaching landfills, and also how to reduce it through source reduction, donation, composting, and anaerobic digestion. She also works on greening the federal government, big job there, the largest purchaser of goods and services in the U.S. So she graduated from UC Berkeley in 2008 with her bachelor's and a degree in conservation resource studies. <laughs> okay, and Mira Inbar in the middle here. So she got her MBA from the Haas School in 2009. She has a bachelor's in biology and environmental sciences from Oberlin College. Um, she's now the senior market manager for Dow Kokum, and I had to look this up, but it's such an exciting place. They're worrying about the next generation batteries for the transportation industry. Being in transportation, I know this is a huge thing that has to get solved, so I'm glad that a lot of smart people are working on it. Um, and there, she focuses on the commercial activities for the commercial truck and bus market. She's also the board member of the nonprofit Live Climate, which she began. And she has also previously worked for Dow Chemical, where she authored and launched a $10 million sustainability partnership. 
and she previously worked in the nonprofit sector where she designed and managed multi-million dollar conservation projects throughout Africa, the Middle East, and Latin America. And she led, I mean, these so impressive. Our graduates always are so impressive. Um, she also led enterprise development with indigenous communities in the Peruvian Andes. So welcome, Mira. Okay, now we had a last minute sub here. So Lauren Finzer, is that, yes, we're very happy to have you, Lauren. So she is the school account manager at um, Revolution Foods. So Revolution Foods focuses on food access. It was one of the um, Fast Company's 50 most innovative companies in the world, and it aims to transform school meals um, by providing healthy, fresh, delicious, affordable meals and nutritional education to all students. So Lauren, in terms of her Berkeley um, credentials, she, her undergrad, I can't even say where her undergrad is from, and so we're just going to skip over that completely. Uh, but both of her parents came to Berkeley, and she's a big Berkeley fan, and they had great experiences, and she wants to come back to business school here at, uh, get an MBA at the hospital. So hopefully I get to speak on an alumni panel after that. <laughs> yeah, right. Then we'll invite you back. Okay, so um, thank you, Lauren. Very nice to have you. Okay, so first what we'll do is we'll do a few rounds of questions that, and kind of going through, first having them talk each about their current position, what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, how they got the position, what challenges they face, and whatever parts of these you want to answer or to address is great. And also, you know, what's hot in sustainability in their jobs now, what direction is their, um, is the energy moving in at their companies. And then after that, we'll come back through and talk about their college experience and post-graduation and then looking ahead. So, but for now, if you could just each talk a little bit about your current position. Do you want to start? Sure. Um, so I work at the US EPA, uh, Pacific Southwest region. Um, so basically I work in California, Arizona, Nevada, Hawaii, and the Pacific Islands, and then 147 tribal nations. Um, and despite, you know, maybe some people's thoughts about the federal government, we actually do have some cool people and do some really cool stuff. Um, I like to think of myself as one of them sometimes. I love my work. Um, but I work in our Office of Pollution Prevention and Solid Waste. Um, and as I just mentioned, I focus a lot on um, food waste, uh, which is the number one material reaching landfills. And actually, um, it's estimated that about uh, we create enough food waste in the U.S. every single day to fill, fill the Rose Bowl Stadium every single day. So if you can imagine that, that's a whole lot of, um, a whole lot of food waste that we're throwing away, uh, whether it happens at the farm or at, at the dinner table. Um, so just day to day, um, I'm really expected to be a generalist sort of person where I talk to somebody in the morning on food donation um, and, you know, maybe at the end of the day have meetings with cities to figure out how they can do renewable energy projects from food. Um, so I do actually a really variety of stuff working with many stakeholders, city, states, local governments, um, uh, industry, um, the federal government trying to green us. Um, we have a huge impact. Um, and I think it's really exciting. I do work in a cubicle, so just put that out there. Um, sometimes I spend the entire day looking at my computer and through Excel spreadsheets, um, which can be really fun. Um, I really like tool creation. Um, but we also get to do really fun things, like I was recently in the city of Cupertino uh, digging through a garbage can at a local grocer because um, we're looking at grocers and as really big producers of food waste and trying to get them to compost or donate or actually reduce it upstream. So some really exciting things. Um, I, I think that government work is, of course, not for everybody, but I think that um, I didn't think it was for myself. Um, and so I think you kind of need to give it a chance. I, I thought I had sold out immediately since this is my first job out of college. And I was kind of upset with myself for the first like week after I accepted the position. But, you know, I think it turned out really well. There's people that are really doing some amazing things. Um, and through working with a, you know, a large government entity, I've gotten to meet um, people in the nonprofit sector and the industry who are really sort of moving the ball forward on a lot of different issues. So I think that's in a nutshell sort of what I do um, may not be very glamorous, but I think it's definitely worthwhile. So I work for Dow Cocum. We are a joint venture of Dow Chemical that was set up to manufacture batteries for electric cars. And I'm in charge of all of the strategic marketing and I also do sales. So I was one of the first 10 members of the company 
Uh, and so when we're forming this company, all we had was a hole in the ground where we wanted to put a 400,000 square foot plant. Now we have that 400,000 square foot plant in Michigan, and we have to find somewhere to sell all the batteries that we're starting to produce. It's an emerging market. It's uh, definitely a challenging market because uh, there's lots of ups and downs. I'm sure you're reading the press about companies that are doing well and not doing so well. So the marketing side of my job is focused on really uh, dissecting the markets in the US, China, and Europe, and uh, working internally to say, what should our product offering be for each one of those regions? What should our pricing be? What should our promotional strategies be? Uh, who should be our customer targets and why? Uh, which segments are we going to really go after? What's our value proposition compared to all the other battery competition out there? So that's the marketing side of my job. It's very much, it's more strategy than, let's say, promotional. Uh, and then the sales part of my job is trying to sell directly into uh, major automotive companies. So I focus more on the truck and bus side for sales because, frankly, that's going to be a much faster market for electric transportation. The consumer market, like you and I, it's going to take a lot longer to take off. But companies like UPS, FedEx, Coca-Cola, they see a business case in electric transportation because of the fuel savings and other cost reductions. So it's a much faster, higher volume market initially. So day to day, I am actually negotiating with some pretty tough players out there uh, and trying to um, put together proposals and pricing and all of that on specific battery options. I work very closely with our engineering team to design the right battery pack because battery packs have to be different for every type of vehicle. You have different space constraints. You have different power requirements. Um, so that's what I do. I think I'll start by talking about how I got to where I am. Um, right now, as you heard, I'm managing the relationships between the school partners and the other partners and the company, Revolution Foods, which provides fresh and healthy school meals. I actually got there through a route that was much more, at first, focused on sustainability writ large. I started out working as an intern at an environmental def defense fund, then was in the environmental program at the Hewlett Foundation, sort of confused about what aspects of sustainability I wanted to focus in on. And then I came across the opportunity to go actually to India on a Fulbright grant and study fruit and vegetable supply chains and waste there. And that was where this interest in sustainability and efficiency and how we use our natural resources in a way that keeps us all healthy and happy found its, its home in sustainable food. So I studied fruit and vegetable supply chains, got really sort of compelled by this idea that much of how we produce and consume food right now is unsustainable, not only for reasons of how it's grown, et cetera, which you are all intimately familiar with, but also in the way that it's impacting our health. It's just not sustainable for us in much of the developed world and then also parts of the developing world to be feeding us thing, ourselves things that make us sick. And that was what brought me to Revolution Foods. Because we really have this mission of making sure that every student in the nation has access to fresh, healthy, real food that will keep them learning and growing in a really healthy way. And what I'm doing now with Revolution Foods is actually helping, helping manage that relationship with the schools. Because often schools are coming to us from having district food providers or um, sort of those big trucks, Cisco trucks coming in, bringing packaged frozen food. And that's just stuff you stick in the oven and heat. It's pretty easy to manage. It's not fresh. It doesn't require them to tell us what they want a week ahead of time. Fresh food is really a new thing for many of these schools. So my role is to make it as easy as possible for them, both in finding out about Revolution Foods and making that transition to fresh and healthy food, and then also on the day-to-day -day end, um, having me there as a partner in case anything goes wrong or in case their, their students have questions about what this is. I come out and actually work very directly with students in addition to meeting with superintendents and principals and the sort of school governance. I do nutrition education in the schools as well as part of what we offer because we're very committed to the idea that it's not just getting healthy food on the plates of students. It's also helping them understand what it means to eat sustainably and healthfully over the long term. So a lot of that is conducting nutrition education activities and then also lessons. So that's really the most fun part of my job, of course. 
Um, and I think talking about sustainability within a healthy food access company may not immediately, I don't know, make a lot of sense, but, but to me really coming from that background of thinking of sustainability writ large and then, well, how does health fit into that? How does buying as much as we can local, as much as we can organic, how does that fit in? Having compostable containers, maybe not being, right now they're recyclable, moving to compostable. It, thinking about, well, even though we're feeding these meals that are sometimes individually packaged, how do we make that as sustainable as possible? Has really tied in, for me, to that initial goal of, of working in sustainability. So that's my day to day. Okay, great. Um, so, so now let me ask you to try to reflect back to when you were in college, either at Berkeley or elsewhere. Um, and you know, the questions, thinking about the students now who are here, you know, what can you remember? Like, did you know what you wanted to do when you grew up? And, um, and what did you do that you thought was helpful in terms of getting you into this career? What would you have done differently? Um, and yeah, I guess that's the question. <coughs> Um, so I started college actually uh, wanting to do, be a research biologist. I sort of, I really liked, uh, you know, marine biology when I was in high school and so I was like, came in here um, and wanted to do MCB or IB um, and, then, and then quickly realized, you know, actually I'm interested in microbes. I really want to deal with bacteria. Um, and at the same time, uh, I had sort of, I was living in the residence halls and I heard of a program called the Residential Sustainability Education Coordinator Program, and which is a mouthful, RACC program. Um, and so I volunteered for that my freshman year. And I actually had a conversation with my parents where, you know, I was like, no, I'm gonna be a research biologist. I don't wanna be an environmentalist. Like, I don't wanna live in a shack for the rest of my life. Like, I actually wanna, you know, have a little bit of money or something. Um, so it was making the conscious decision that that was not a career path for me. It was just like a sort of a something to do on the side. Um, and then, you know, in my sophomore year, I ran the Residential Sustainability Education Coordinator Program and started getting much more involved in campus and spending much more time actually on sustainability initiatives than going to class. Um, so, and so... I'll pretend I didn't. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I did watch the uh, webcast, so if that counts, you know, generally in one day. Um, so I did attend, I guess. Um, so, but I still did that, and I kept working, and then I said, okay, maybe this environmental stuff, like I can weave it into the microbial stuff, and so I um, decided to double major in conservation and resource studies. Um, and then I kept getting more into it, and I went to class even less, and um, you know, I worked with CACs, I was a CACs co-chair, um, I worked building sustainability at Cal, I did a lot of things on campus, I actually worked for um, the campus for three and a half of my four and a half years here. Um, and after three and a half years here, I had three more classes that I needed to finish to get my microbial biology degree, um, and more classes for CRS, and I was gonna have to stay five years. And so after three and a half years, I gave up the microbial actually, um, and just decided to finish the CR, um, CRS. Um, but I do not regret that actually at all. I, th I now, I work on a lot of micro stuff with food waste, um, going to renewable energy through anaerobic digestion and composting being a biological process. I have that background without having the degree, so I really enjoy that. And I didn't think it was actually gonna play into the work that I was gonna do, but it really did. Um, and so I think, you know, I. I feel like I took a fairly straightforward path, but I did wiggle a little bit. Um, but I, I have to say that what really convinced me, I think, was the great work that the staff and students do on this campus um, and spending three and a half years working for the campus and going through buildings and doing energy audits and digging through trash. And, you know, it really made me super passionate for, for what I do. And I actually think um, in such a competitive field these days, that hands-on work is really what um, I, I personally think made me um, a better candidate for working for the EPA where most of the people have master's degrees and or like five to 10 years of experience before they start. Um, and I came in sort of you know, very fresh, very green, um, but knew how to do trash audits, taught people in my, in my unit actually who had been working on recycling for years how to actually do waste audits. Um, and having that hands-on experience, I would say, um, for me, it was great having the theory of the class when I watched it on webcast, <laughs> but for me, I think the really critical part was, you know, getting my hands dirty and seeing how real-world implementation of environmental issues actually happens, because 
it's not always pretty like you, would, you read in the textbooks or you hear about. So I think for me it was really critical and um, I really highly suggest that for anybody to get hands-on experience um, in any field, environmental or otherwise. Yeah, so my path certainly wasn't straightforward, and if you had told me in undergrad I'd be selling batteries, I would never believe you. Uh, I actually had an undergrad in biology and environmental science. I wanted to be a conservation biologist also. I did my research in Costa Rica and the rainforests, and then I uh, volunteered in Peru for a while in the Andes, and then I went to work uh, in Africa on conservation. I worked in Africa for about four and a half years, and when I was working in Africa, uh, I, was, I was working for a nonprofit, and I was working alongside some pretty big um, companies there, and I just felt like I was pushing a giant. So I said, what if I went and I was in a company and I could make these, discuss these decisions myself? Um, and so I decided to go to business school at Berkeley. Uh, and so I think, you know, I, so, I, so I actually then joined Dow Chemical in the sustainability group, but pretty quickly after I joined, uh, we formed this new company, and I was swept into this new company, and here I am today selling batteries. Uh, going to mostly all male panels, but this is my <laughs> first all female panel. Uh, so I think if I reflect on that, what helped me in undergrad in my career, for my career today, it would definitely be that openness uh, and ability to um, jump into different types of projects. So exposure to ambiguity is really important. Um, so whether that be, you know, re doing research in Costa Rica or volunteering in the Andes doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, geographical, but exposing yourself to some kind of risk, getting out of your comfort zone and being in amb ambiguous uh, environments is really important. As I jumped into this role, we had no factory, we had no strategy, we had no market. I didn't know the first thing about batteries, but I could learn. I had some hard skills from business school. Uh, and so I had to deal with a whole lot of ambiguity. So I would say, yeah, just continue to challenge yourself, take risks, and when you get out of school, people are gonna tell you things can't be done, they're gonna tell you that uh, those things are too risky, and just continue to push yourself and push, push that thought process. I'd heartily second what both Mira and Laura said. I think being scrappy and comfortable with ambiguity, and then doing and doing more and more and studying and studying less and less both really <laughs> resonate. Um, I think the opportunity of being on campus is incredible. As a student or as a staff member or even a faculty member, you have this or cool organization that you're absolutely invested in. And what I did as a student was really see what I could do by mobilizing fellow students. So um, I wasn't here, but we had a, a campus sustainability group that I, I headed for two years and really um, worked with to see where are the points on this campus where we as students can speak up and make a difference. And it may be small things, for example, switching all, calling up all the departments ha by hand and having them switch to using recycled paper and trying to use less paper and just that sort of hands-on thing where one person can sit alone in their dorm room and call departments and it's doing that. But then also sort of larger mobilization around could we have a green fund? Or could we bring green campus to our campus as well to have interns? I heard some of that in the awards. It sounds super exciting. And I think that tangibility of I'm here in this place looking for opportunities to make a positive difference. Mary, you sort of talked about that where you were in Africa. And looking to see how I can use my energies in very real world ways. That's what, what you were talking about a little bit too. Um, and that has been what I use most, I think. Those, that idea of doing the best with what we can and, doing some, and making a, a tangible difference, I use every day in my work. Um, it's setting up meetings within a school, talk, seeing what I can in how the students are behaving or where there are leadership groups, where there might be a video production class that would do a cool video about healthy food, assessing what resources are available, and then seeing how we can mobilize, running meetings, all those skills you gain from working on campus doing sustainability stuff um, to move things forward given what assets you have. Okay, great. Um, great advice, you guys. I'm, I'm taking notes so I can pass this on to students. Um, okay, so in terms of 
if you're, so we've heard what you do, we've heard you look back to your college days. Now looking forward, and we won't tell your employees or employers or anything, <laughs> but you know, where do you see yourself going? And what are the, you know, what are the hot, either sustainability directions or not, or is it within your company, or is it, are there other exciting places that you see you may want to go to? Okay, so I don't see myself being a career bureaucrat in the federal government. Um, I think this is really a stepping stone for me. I mean, it's hard to say where I'd be um, in the future, but I am planning on going back to school um, in August 2013, so I'm really excited. Um, and I'm going back to school actually to um, do what I was like convinced I was gonna do when I graduated. Um, I was convinced when I graduated that the specific job I was gonna get would be working with greening existing buildings on behavior or occupant changes. Um, that job was really hard slash impossible to find for me. Um, so, but I'm doing something I think, you know, that is helping me on my career path. So what I want to go back to school for is really looking at the nexus between um, environmental behavior change and sustainable infrastructure. Um, and sustainable infrastructure, I am super interested in wastewater treatment, waste, and um, green built, greening existing buildings. Um, and so, especially wastewater treatment, I, another career goal, maybe I'll be there in 10 years, is to work at a wastewater treatment plant for a little bit of time. Um, so, I re but I really want to figure out how we can sort of use that sustainable infrastructure, use green buildings, use this idea of recycling to further uh, more wide-ranging environmental behavior change. Um, so that's what I'm going to be doing. I'll probably, maybe in 10 years, still be in school. Who knows? I could be just, a, even though I didn't go to class, maybe I would if it were more <laughs> practical. Um, and I actually do think that uh, one of the experiences at Cal was, I, again, I, I did love um, the academics here, but I would love to become a professor and actually um, work with students on more, on both the theory, but also really try to get behind the implementation aspect of it in classes, because I think that's something that, um, you know, the environmental field is still really new, so I think that's a little bit of a gap in a lot of classes, is really how we translate our knowledge into action. So being able to come back and teach students, like, hey, let's figure out what the differences are between the theory and how it should work and how it actually does work in sort of creative solutions and figuring things out, because um, things are not black and white, and I um, and I sort of deal with that on a daily basis. I am somebody who says more, more composting, more composting, but at the same time, I also work um, because composting creates VOC emissions, which um, creates ground level ozone, so smog, um, and there's lots of regulations now coming down on compost facilities. So what I work on on a day-to-day -day basis as well is trying to figure out how you sort of measure this like fantastic opportunity to compost and to keep food waste out of the landfill with potentially endangering people's health through air emissions in especially like San Joaquin Valley and South Coast um, or you know, LA area. And you know, as I would like to say that, oh yeah, just more composting, but it really is sort of that balance and trying to figure out solutions that are win-win and they're not always easy to find or within the regulations or you know whatever it may be. So um, that's sort of, that's a convoluted sort of thing. I don't know where I'll be, but that's sort of where I want to start going. Yeah, I definitely won't tell you where I'm going to be in 10 years because if I look back 10 years ago, I never would have imagined that I would be here doing what I'm doing. So I think I'll be open to whatever life brings. Uh, but I'm for sure focused right now on making this company a success. And I would love to look in five years, 10 years, look at some of the electric vehicles with our batteries on the road or the future FedEx delivery truck that delivers my package, knowing that it has our batteries and it's zero emission. That would be really, when I think 10 years down the road, I would love to start seeing some of this stuff actually in real life, seeing some of the results of all the hard work today. So I think the most important thing is to do what you find meaning in and to be with good people. Make sure that, you know, sometimes jobs sound really cool and you end up with really lousy teams. Uh, so make sure that, you know, you're working with good people that you respect, they're honest, and they're hardworking. Yeah. I think it's hard to find a good organization and hard to find good teams, and I think I've found mine. Um, Revolution Foods is absolutely, I think, one of those win-win things where you're getting fresh and healthy food to students when they most need it while they're growing and developing. And it's just something I feel like I would spend my life working towards. And I feel like the company is full of good people. And I love, actually, that it's a for-profit company. That may be some, a question in your heads. 
um, but it was, uh, it's a social enterprise and there was a, a quandary at the beginning whether or not to make it a nonprofit or for-profit. And they went for-profit so that as we scale, we can continue to have that funding to make it possible. Because if you're a nonprofit, you have to keep asking for grants. But because we're a for-profit, every new school and new student that we serve a lunch to is helping us serve more lunches to other students. So I think, I don't know, that blend of it being a self-sustainable solution and being exactly what I'm passionate about makes me hope that in 10 years I'm still working for Revolution Foods after having obtained a Haas Berkeley <laughs> MBA. <laughs> Okay, so let me, um, I'll go to two more specific questions and then we're gonna open it up for you guys to ask questions. So one of them is when you look back, is there anything you would have done just differently? You can think for a minute. Oh, you're ready to go. Well, I'll go. Um, so um, I'd say no, cause like got me where I am and I'm pretty happy with where I am now. I think, yeah, I think I would pretty much, do it the same. Maybe go to some classes less than I did. There were some that really did not help me at all. Um, so, or, <laughs> um, or I just maybe sort of, I really focused on the, the really environmental portion of environmentalism, like the, you know, saving animals and, you know, pe that sort of thing. I think I'd focus more on the people aspect and the, the money aspect. Um, I do not understand economics at all. I took one class, and I, would, I think I'd really try to focus more on that piece because it is crucial, and I have to ask tons of people tons of questions just to even try to understand what people are talking about with like ROI and like different things like that. <laughs> so um, I definitely try to focus more on that and not just um, not just sort of the like. I just want to be green, so I'm doing this stuff because not everybody feels that way, especially in other parts of the world and country. Definitely would have done my undergrad at Berkeley. <laughs> um, honestly, I wish I had more of an engineering background. I'm really happy that I have a business degree, and I think it's helped made me solutions oriented, and it's been really practical and useful. Uh, but there's such a dearth of good en engineers out there, and there's such a need for engineers. Uh, we can't find enough engineers to hire, despite the fact that we're in a pretty bad uh, unemployment state in the country. So I would I would have taken engineering classes, and I would have tried to get some more of that background. That's a good panel member. <laughs> I actually, at Berkeley. I actually want to, yeah, I want to second the economics comment also. I mean, when I look back at my career, I wish I would have taken more economics. I've learned a lot in my career, but boy, it would have been nice when I was here to have learned a little bit, so um, anyway. I think I would have taken fewer classes that I was really interested in and that's gonna to sound totally wrong. I think it's great to take classes that you're interested in, but I think it's also important to take classes that are about things that you would not read about on your own. I found myself taking classes like, um, I don't know, health and food in America, or that kind of thing, that is stuff that I end up reading on my own anyway, and I wish that I had stretched myself to take classes that were things that I felt would give me skills that would be useful later on and that I wouldn't study on my own or couldn't study on my own. And balancing that, wanting to be passionate about the class you're taking, and that's a great thing, but also what are things that are out of my comfort zone and that I won't learn on my own. Gosh, I mean, you guys, your advice is so good. The engineering, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, well, you know, you've already given some advice. I mean, the last thing I was going to say is just what's your best piece of advice, but you've given a lot. Does anyone, you one more chance to throw out, has anything come to you in terms of? Anyone? I would say to keep taking risks. Uh, like yeah. I said before, when you get out of school, you might join companies, you might do your own thing. Uh, but if you join a company, typically they're going to tell you that things can't be done. Uh, they're mm -hmm. very risk averse. Uh, even if you do projects with companies and schools, you'll find that out. Uh, so definitely keep pushing that, keep questioning, keep asking why things can't be done, uh, and don't give up just because people are older than you, they've been around the industry for 25 years and they have all this experience. Value your own insights and, and keep pushing the boundaries. I would, I'd second that in the way that also I think stay flexible a little bit because I came out of college really thinking I knew what I wanted to do. Um, and if I had not been flexible, I would still be looking for that job, I'm pretty sure. Um, because especially when you just graduate, if you know you don't have the experience that other people have, but you probably have the passion, but you might need to sort of take some, some baby steps to getting where you want to go, be flexible about 
you know, whether you want to work for the government, and maybe you don't think you do like I did, but um, it was a job, so I took it. Um, you know, so I'd just say, I'd say definitely be flexible and show your passion. Um, when I interview students for internships, um, one of the things is that if I forget you or if I look at your resume, like, the next day and have no clue who you are and whatever, um, you're probably not going to get hired. So be passionate, show your passion. I think that's actually a huge, a huge portion. I think that's what helped me in my interview because I said some dumb things in my interview um, looking back on it. Also, another hint, I told them five weaknesses without them asking what my weaknesses were um, in my interview. So don't do that. And then they asked, <laughs> they, <laughs> they asked me what my strengths were and I got really confused because I hadn't practiced that question, but I'd practiced the weaknesses one. Um, and so I was like, um, I'm passionate, like, you know, questioning my own passion. Um, so I'd say also maybe practice some interview questions or don't <laughs> just tell them your weaknesses. Um, I do have one last yes. bit. Um, I would say seize opportunities to get international experience, but don't discount the Bay Area and getting to know your own home and where you've grown up. I'm really, really, really glad I seized that chance to go to India and do all the international I tr travel that I did while I had that flexibility, no mortgage, no kids. I could pick up and gain insights, I think, that have really helped me look now at where I'm from, I grew up in the Bay Area, and the chance to work with schools all over where I grew up and get to know that place in a way that I just never, I don't know, I never did growing up here, and meet with different kinds of people and feel a, really, a real connection that I didn't before was both informed and enhanced by that international experience. So I think weighing those two kinds of things, don't discount either. Okay, great, so um, let's go ahead and open it up for people who have Questions? Someone's going to have a question. Yeah, and I don't, do we have mics or something? Okay, so. I was wondering how you know when uh, it's time for you to move on to the next thing or the next opportunity and when you feel like you're done with this one. Yeah, I think when you're not feeling challenged anymore and you don't see, you know, anything, what's next for you in that position. For me, when I was working in a nonprofit, I just felt like I had re reached the wall of what I could achieve there. Um, and so I said, maybe I need to be in a different kind of a sector to really make an impact. Um, so that's when I knew it was just time to move on. No? Yeah, it's on. Okay, cool. Um, all of you work in uh, organizations right now that may in some cases be opposed to really powerful private sector interests. So like for instance, agribusiness or fossil fuel or agribusiness again. Um, to what extent do you all have to deal with that in your jobs right now? To what extent does your company have to, to deal with those challenges? And what does that look like for you um, at your jobs right now? So um, I work uh, on diverting food waste from landfills. And whether you know it or not, the landfill industry is a super powerful industry. And they've gotten different forms of government um, to do things that allow them to, in my opinion, not operate as well as they should. Or, or they really just want stuff in landfills. And I think it, it is really difficult. My first year on the job, um, I helped write this report um, with a grantee, and it talked about sort of the drawbacks to the landfill industry. Um, and about a month later, I received an angry email from the five largest landfill operators in Southern California addressed specifically to me and how I was like basically lying and talking about landfills in ways that weren't correct. And I mean, their logic was not sound. It was, I could have written a better, a better paper about landfills than they did. But um, they, it, it's really hard and to, to sort of feel like almost, I felt personally attacked kind of, because it was something that I really believed in. It's, it's difficult and it's not always easy. It's, you can't be successful, I don't think, in sort of most of the time and sort of one interaction with them. And a lot of times it takes compromise. You're probably never gonna get rid of those, or not never. For a while, you, we will probably not be getting rid of those powerful lobbyists or industries. So really trying to find a common ground um, and to you know work with them. Um, I still, it's not like I go and hang out with the landfill people, but um, I, we don't really see eye to eye on that. But I think that, I think there is 
something to be said about finding a common ground and you now find the landfill industry is looking at compost because you know we're putting together things that show that it's actually beneficial for them to sort of start being composters start taking it they can charge more money they can make a valuable product at the end they can do lots of things so um, yeah it's it's an interesting part of of working definitely so it's a huge challenge for us uh, you know the EV industry got some subsidies with the um, stimulus money uh, and now we're under a whole lot of scrutiny uh, renewable sector in general by Congress that that was a waste of money we put money here we put money there millions hundred million dollars here hundred million dollars my company also received about 160 million dollars you compare that with ten billion dollars a year that the oil and gas industry gets and all of the additional tax incentives and the um, kinds of incentives for people to invest in oil and gas projects which just merely do not exist in the EV industry, it's just not an even playing field. And so we feel that every single day. We feel that with the political pressure, you know, now uh, some of our customers weren't able to get the DOE loans that they were promised. It's putting them on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, it's just not an even playing field. So you have to figure out how do you educate the end user in a way that this is still going to be a sustainable industry in spite of the fact that we're starting on such uneven ground. Um, and I think, you know, there is some pressure, but frankly, I think the oil and gas industry will continue to get subsidies. They're much more powerful. They're much larger. So we just have to figure out how do we create this sustainable business case. And there is incredible operational savings that end users get from driving electric vehicles. Fuel maintenance, less brake wear, less, you know, no fluid repair, replacement, no transmission repair. It's more about quantifying those things and making sure that there is a case for the end user so we can still survive. Yeah, so those subsidies, um, we feel it every single day because making fresh and healthy food and using organic and local ingredients just plain costs more than using lots of corn products. Um, and I think the way that we deal with it is by helping schools and the people who are spending that money understand the benefits of fresh and healthy food. Um, another way is just through sheer efficiency. We just try to partner with as many companies as we can, try to get them to give us discounts, um, try to be as efficient of an operation as a business as we can to keep our prices affordable for all students. Because that's really the mission, is to make it so that anyone, even if you're in a very poor district or um, receiving reimbursement for lunch, can afford fresh and healthy food. And so doing our best on that front and just living with that, knowing that that discrepancy is there, and then um, helping people understand why it's worth paying the money for good food. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a fan of your phone. Sorry. Um, so I think that uh, in my time doing sustainability, I've run into at least one oh shit moment. Um, can you tell us about one of yours and how you got over it? Can you please define an oh shit moment? No. <laughs> uh, just something that makes you um, question what you're doing and how you're going to get through it. Not including right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to start with mine. Um, okay. Um, I think that uh, applying to grad school was one of them. I, uh, I, uh, <laughs> I got the panel. Um, <laughs> Uh, tell us about your uh, favorite victory in the sustainability field. <laughs> I've had a few. Uh, one was writing a biodiversity strategy for Dow, and it led to a $10 million partnership with TNC for Dow to start measuring biodiversity 
at various sites and um, start compensating for impacts. Uh, so that's one. And then I just landed my first deal uh, with a major automotive company to supply batteries. <laughs> so the, one of the future vehicles, hopefully outside your door, will have our batteries in it. So mine actually happened here at Cal. Um, and well, maybe ha I maybe realized it afterwards. Um, so I actually co-founded uh, the Building Sustainability at Cal program. Um, and I, I co-founded a couple things while I was here. And it's sad when they don't exist after you leave. And I think um, it was a reflection of, uh, in one thing, my leadership, um, and not really seeing things as like seeing a future for things beyond sort of what I saw right there and what was happening within my own little box. Um, and after I graduated, I left and I've been gone for two years. Um, I still kept in touch with the people who were running Building Sustainability at Cal. There was a GO team. Um, and I think that's when it hit me that like I had helped create a program that is still impacting people and people are making it better. The people that lead it now are just continuing to expand it. And I think for me that's huge and has impacted how I now do my, my work um, because if I... You, my mentor in, in college, Lisa Bauer, always said, you know, if I get hit by a Mack truck, you know, what have I left so other people can do my work? Because the world's not going to stop when we're not here. Um, so I, I kind of understand what she's saying now. Like, I understand it. we got to think about how other people can take on our work and make it better and keep it going um, because the world does not start and end with me. So I think that was, for me, a huge victory. I'm still thinking about the first question, and I think <laughs> I want to answer it. <laughs> I... So when I was in India, what I was studying for my Fulbright was basically how fruit and vegetable markets are changing as supermarkets come in. So looking at what impact that has on food waste, which is quantified at about 40% in India right now between farm and plate, which is insane. 40% of food going to waste. And that figure was what motivated me to go there and study how big chains were potentially changing that, whether through cold storage and automation, something was happening that was decreasing that waste and thereby better for the environment and better for people because food could be sold for fewer, for less, less, um, less, at less costly prices, that kind of thing. It all seemed really great, thinking about these companies coming in and having positive effects on food waste. And I think my oh shit moment was not till a couple of months into studying this and getting really excited about the potential of these large companies, but it really came as I walked into a huge air-conditioned corporate office in Gurgaon, India, which is a suburb outside of Delhi. And I felt to myself, I felt like I was working for the man. It was that kind of like, wow, have I sold out? Am I not realizing what effects there could be, not just maybe on food waste, but also on all those smallholder farmers who have jobs, the, the people who push the carts and sell the fruit and vegetables right now, not through supermarkets, what effect could, what negative effects could I be having by working to decrease food waste in this one sense by not getting the bigger picture? So for me, that was one of those moments where I just had to step back and question everything that I was doing and everything that I wanted to spend my time on and my research and definitely uh, one of those moments. Um, hi, I'm a student here, undergrad, and I, my question, so I've been getting involved with different things and I've been changing my mind a lot about what I want to do. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk about the balance between the value of sticking with something and really learning about one thing and developing, like staying with one project and then jumping around, the value of jumping around and learning about different things you can do and having that experience. So I think from a career perspective and as far as like looking at how hireable you are, it's good to have that long term like where there's a deliverable or you've had some success um, and actually being able to pinpoint the the contribution that you made to the project by staying with it for a longer period of time, I think that's huge. Um, and being able to really, you can really get in, you really get in depth with like different projects um, by having sort of that longer term commitment to something. Um, but I think 
you know, there is, I, I never say no, which is one of the weaknesses I pointed out during my job interview. <laughs> um, so, um, the thing is I did a lot of things. So I, I think I did a lot of things for short periods of time, but then there was at least like two things that I definitely did for very long periods of time. And I think just balancing what's okay for you where you're not killing yourself because you've made so many commitments. Um, try to do at least one or two things long term and say yes to as much as you can do, again, without killing yourself with commitments. I had to um, be part-time in school for a semester because I sort of realized that I had taken on too much and was working much too much. Um, so I think that's something to, that you need to figure out what balance you want. I would not, in undergrad, I would not focus on, on trying to get hired or trying to get the perfect career. I would focus on figuring it out, what is it that you like to do? Uh, and get there however you need to get there. Um, over the long term, I look back, I don't even use my undergraduate degree. Uh, it, what I learned from it was all of these other skills and the experiences it gave me. And it did give me some good knowledge, but I think if I had focused so much and I didn't pursue those other things, I wouldn't end up happy anyways, right? Now is the time where you have to explore yourself and give yourself some room to grow. Uh, and don't judge yourself so much, like, am I going to find my optimal career? Chances are when you graduate undergrad, you're not going to find your uh, optimal career, but you might find yourself, so. Absolutely. I think exploring around until you know you found it, and I think you should feel when you, when you know you found it. I feel like by hopping around and, and doing all the different things I did in different countries, I, I I'm really glad I did that, and I think I gained a lot of skills and a lot of perspective by doing it, but now I feel like I found it, and I think you'll know. Hi, um, I just wondered uh, what you felt was one of the biggest challenges facing this movement of sustainability, and especially in your line of work, and any kind of creative solutions that are being bounced around on how to you know, combat those challenges. I think the stigma is one of them. I see it every day trying to get kids to eat our food because it doesn't look like the normal hamburger. If it has a whole wheat bun, if it comes with baby carrots, that kind of thing, it's not always something that seems appealing to them. And it turns them off even more if I say it's healthy or sustainable. So finding ways to either get rid of that stigma or work outside of that stigma. Tem I mean, temporarily I'm trying to work outside of it by trying to get them to eat it because it's delicious as well, which is what they care about. But over the long term, making sh some somehow finding a way to change the culture so that sustainability doesn't have this ugh effect on, on some groups of people. So we're a new industry and we're a new technology, so it's very challenging because we're combating the baseline, you know, the gasoline engine which has a lot of uh, support, it has a lot of money, it has, it's this business as usual. So, so that's a huge challenge. I think any time you try to get into a disruptive market, uh, disruptive technology, uh, you have to battle a lot of kind of baseline thinking. Yeah, and I think one of the things is just sort of how um, the current economy values different things and how we don't account for externalities is huge and I wish I understood more about economy stuff, but I think one of the things is landfilling is super cheap and composting is expensive and we don't really account for any of, or you know, that the landfill is, you know, potentially polluting the groundwater or, you know, um, emitting methane gases or the fact that when you apply compost to a soil, um, you can potentially increase water infiltration, which decreases runoff so it can make a watershed much healthier. Um, and we don't account for that in our current accounting. And economics is just such a powerful driver that by not accounting for that, we're doing a huge disservice to, you know, the things, you know, the sustainable things that we, you know, that actually do have those ecosystem services. Um, and so I think somebody other than me who's really, really smart, um, figuring out sort of how to start incorporating that into our current, you know, economic value system. I think that's a that's a huge barrier, and I hope that. Um, I know they're brilliant people working on it, so I hope that happens sooner rather than later. Hi, my name is Ben. Um, I'm a grad student here in civil engineering, and I, I'm definitely interested in sustainability. I think it's so important. Um, I'm studying lean construction, and there are a lot of ways to reduce waste. So I had a question about India. 
Um, as you say, I mean, it's really important for India um, because they're losing like a, a third of their vegetables and stuff on the way to the market. So there's all this food that is just going to waste. Um, and do you think it was a good thing or a bad thing that they didn't let Walmart in? Because Walmart would have, you know, they have a lot of supply chain experience, but on the other hand, you know, there's things that go along with that, such as putting small farmers out of business or that kind of thing. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's one that is a real gray area. When I was in India, yeah, Walmart actually was in, they couldn't be in 100% in retail, but they were in in wholesale. And I met with them and they're doing a lot of neat things around supply chain management as they are here in the United States, thinking about how we, how we save more of our fruit and vegetables. Um, that effect though on, on the s small businesses that sell fruit and vegetables in, in the big cities or, or really all over India is another huge thing though. And I think um, you, you framed that question in a way that made it seem very gray and I think I just completely agree that it's a gray area. Um, there are other things that also can enter in. Um, if you're thinking about, well, right now when there are such small businesses doing fruit and vegetable market, sort of bringing them from farm to table, um, there's no way to track whether those fruit and vegetables are organic. So I think what I would say in response to that question is that Walmart has a huge opportunity to mitigate the negative effects and maximize the positive effects if it does go into India and, and really expand there. And I think ways that it can mitigate the negative effects are by really taking care to design its stores in ways that don't encourage Indians to buy the kind of processed unhealthy food that supermarkets often encourage us to consume here in the United States. That's a major one in terms of nutrition. I think in terms of not having those, not destroying those jobs of people who are independently employed, finding some kind of store model that can employ people on their own, maybe through a sort of franchise model, that kind of thing. Um, not building the same kinds of terribly inefficient big box stores out here that have come with the growth of suburbs, I think is a major one. Um, and then taking advantage of that opportunity to have a transparent supply chain to really introduce things like demand for organic agriculture. So by tying consumers directly to the farmers that are producing their food in a way that can't happen as the current system stands, Walmart could really help build a movement for sustainable food in India as already is starting to, to be built here in the United States. I think there's incredible opportunity and that it's not so much is Walmart coming in a good or a bad thing, but how can we make this as much of a good thing as possible if it's going to happen? And if it's not going to happen, how can we make the most of, the, of what system will be in place? I hope that answers your question. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, um, I work for an organic wholesaler on the San Francisco produce market, and I'm just wondering, do you work directly with the farms to get the food, or do you work with wholesalers or big companies like a Cisco? So I'm, I don't actually purchase the food, so I'm gonna do my best to answer that. I know we work with a range of producers and that we're trying more and more to work with smaller, organic, particularly producers, so let's chat afterwards about whether we might work with you. <laughs> okay, so, um, let's wrap this up and thank you very much, Laura and Mira and Lauren, for your great advice. It was wonderful. And Laura, I heard you about teaching, so <laughs> um, try to get students to come to class. But anyway, I mean, there's so much. <laughs> Actually, the Wall Street Journal agrees with you. I don't know if you saw, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal recently about teaching and innovation and, and more hands-on work, basically. So, but there was so much great advice beyond not going to class. And the thing that I think was most um, striking to me is the passion that all you guys have for your work. And I think that's what it is. You have to somehow find what your passion is. And it may take a while and you may take some different turns, but somehow you'll have to find it and you will find it. So with that, I'll turn it back to you two. Yeah, so we just want to say we greatly appreciate all of you being here, and we greatly appreciate our monitor for the for helping <laughs> moderator. What did I say? Monitor. It's okay. No, no, no oh, you're fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> for this informative and enjoyable 
enjoyable panel session. So as a token of our gratification, um, we have mugs for each of you. These were um, designed and created by the Berkeley Art Studio, and each is made from reused clay and glaze. Thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, before closing, um, we just wanted to tell you about one more surprise. Um, we encourage you all to look under your seats. Um, wait for it. <laughs> if you find a Bring Your Own Mug sticker, you will win a free Bring Your Own Mug, um, recently funded by the Green Initiative Fund. They're travel mugs. Um, and there should be 10. So if you don't find the 10, you can also look around. <laughs> so if you've got a sticker, pull it off and save it. <laughs> save it. We'll, we'll give you one at the end. Um, <laughs> They're not really coming off. <laughs> but um, again, we really want to thank our amazing panelists and moderator. Um, we know that the job market and sustainability is a big concern for a lot of people, a big hope for a lot of people. So that was why we really, as CACs, decided to have this panel, as we thought um, we were hoping, since you students especially do so much great work for this campus, it was the least we could do is maybe give you some good advice and tips for moving forward. Um, and lastly, we want to thank you. Thank you all for coming. We hope that you leave here um, inspired to continue to expand sustainability efforts. Um, happy Earth Week. Woo! <laughs> <laughs>